We read in the portion of Toldos, Elo Toldos Yitzchok ben Avrom. These are the progeny of Yitzchok, the son of Avrom. Avrom holds is Yitzchok. Avrom fathered Yitzchok. So, who are the Toldos of Yitzchok? Who are the children? Yaakov Esav. Yaakov and Esav were the children of Yitzchok. So we hear the Sifzich HaChom, it was the commentary, and Rashi explains, we have, the Vav is always a connecting letter, and, and these are the children. What's the and? So he explains, just as Avram had two children, one was a Tzadik, and one was a Rosha, Yitzchok was the Tzadik, and Ishmael was the Rosha, was the evil one. Identically, Yitzchok had a similar situation. One was the Tzadik, Yaakov was the Tzadik, and Esav was the Rosha. So that's the Eila told us. Similarly, Yitzhak, his children reflected the same profile as Avram's children. One was evil, one was right, devoutly righteous. So it's obviously difficult here. The Torah tells us, Ve'ela told us Yitzhak and Avram. So we refer to Yitzhak, the son of Avram. Then it continues, Avram holy to Yitzhak. Avram fathered Yitzhak. It's, if Yitzchok is the son of Avram, it's obvious. So who fathered Yitzchok? Avram was the father of Yitzchok. So what does the mean of Avram holis Yitzchok? So Rashi cites the Medrash. La'acha shekorah ha'kodesh baruchu shmo Avram. Until Avram had the hail added to his name, he wasn't able to father a child. It's only when he became circumcised, Hashem added the letter hey to his name, and only then was he able to father a child from Sari Menu, and this was Yitzhak. Aka Holy des Yitzhak. So this is the meaning of the, the Posuk, the verse. These are the children of Yitzhak, the son of Avram. But mm-hmm. when was Avram able to father Yitzhak? When he became Avram, that's when he was able to father Yitzhak. The hay was added to his name. What the, what difference does it make? I mean you read the narrative, that's what it says. He was circumcised. He had the name change, and then he was able to father Yitzchok. Now, we had mentioned in the past the two locations based on a verse in Tilim. The Torah tells us we know that one of the appellations, unpronounceable names of God, is Ko, Yud Heg. So the Gemara tells us, based on the Posuk, a verse in Tilim, David Amel says, Ki Beko Hashem Tzuralomim, with the letters Yud and Hey those letters of that unpronounceable name of God, God formed the worlds, in plural. So the Gemara says, the Talmud says that the physical world was formed with the spirituality which is contained within the letter He, and the world to come was formed within the spirituality of the letter Yud. So the Yalkut, the Midrash says that what Hashem had said to Avram Avinu, that what it took to bring about all existence which is the letter He, the spirituality, and letter He brought about the terrestrial, the celestial, the galaxies, and this seemingly, relatively speaking, infinite universe, to be able to allow you to have the ability to father the future patriarch of the Jewish people, I have to add that same letter to your name to have that ability. But without the adding of the letter He, you, that limited person. So what actually happened when Hashem added the letter He to the name of Avram? He became a different being. Although in the physical sense he looked the same, but in terms of his significance, his value, his dimension, his dimension became an all-encompassing dimension which is the equivalent of all existence. Just as all existence came about through the letter He, Avram became this all-encompassing person which is the equivalent of all existence as a result of the Ehe, the spirituality of the Ehe being added, infusing him, activating his ability and expanding it that he should be able to have Father Yitzchok. This is Avraham Holid Yitzchok. To give us an appreciation of what was needed to bring about Yitzchok. It's Avraham. In Parshas Bereshit, Porsche Bereshit, it says, Behi Borom. So Rashi over there explains 
Behi Barom means with the hay. God created existence with the hay. Behi Barom. But the Midrash tells us that the letters of Behi Barom, if you rearrange the letters, it spells the name Avram. Avraham. Meaning, just as Behi Barom means when he created them, all existence, Avram was the equivalent of all existence. This is Behi Barom. If you reconjugate the letters, it's Avram. So Avram is the equivalent of all existence. And this is why Kalamatzel Nefesh Achsmi Yisrael, if you save a Jewish life, what is it equivalent of? As if you save the whole world. Because the Jew, in his innate value, to bring about his entity, his existence, it, it's needed what was brought to bring out all existence. saw something interesting uh, in a Sefer by Rav Yitzhak Chover in his commentary his compilation of things he had written he said something interesting that the Torah tells us that Rivka was barren was not Korah she wasn't meant to have children now Miraculously, due to Yitzchok's insistent tefillah, supplication, Hashem allowed her to have a child. Rivka had a child. The child that Rivka had, did both children, were miracle children. Miracle. It, it's not part of nature. Those children didn't come back about based on a natural level. It was not part of nature. If she wasn't meant to have a child because she didn't have the reproductive organs within her. So how did she have it? It's a miracle. Now, miracle has relevance to spirituality. If the Jews live as a spiritual people, what do we do? We ascend to the highest levels, even beyond physical existence. We dictate physical existence. What happens if the Jew falls? How low do we fall? We fall to the to a level, to the dust. That's the level of persecution. That's the level to what degree we're decimated. Why? Because he mm -hmm. says, what is the essence of the Jew? The essence of the Jew is what? Is miracle. What's miracle? That's spirituality. So if the Jew himself doesn't live within the spiritual realm doing Torah mitzvahs, then what, what is the result? If that is the essence, it, fall, it, it turns back to dust. Because it's not meant to be. Dust represents non-existence, non-entity. Your existence is only within the, within the context of miracle. Miracle is spiritual. So what's spiritual? Torah mitzvahs, that's spiritual. What happens if you remove that from the equation? What happens to, to the Jew? He falls, becomes dust. Totally becomes brittle and goes back to the dust. Is a medrash where Hashem says to Yaakov, you know, your children will be like the dust of the earth. So the medrash says, just as when you have dust, when the wind blows, it scatters it in every direction, identically, if you, your children don't observe the Torah and mitzvahs, they'll be scattered to all corners of the earth. So how, what do you do when you have dust if you want it to become an entity and something which is substantial. You add water to it. If you add water to dust, then it becomes, it becomes something which is an entity. It could be formed. It becomes, some, it becomes a substance. Otherwise, it's just scattered. Now, what is the water element that has to be added to the dust? The water element that has to be added to the dust is Torah. Because the Gemara tells us, based on psukim, on verses, that Torah is compared to water. Just as water flows from an elevated location to a lower location, identically, Torah can only be contained in the person who is truly humble. It's humble. That's, it flows from a high location to a lower location. Only Misha Dato Shvelo, you have a humble spirit, a humble mindset. But also, what is water? Water is, 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 is the staple of life. That's water. Without water, existence can't live. Without water, the Jew can't exist. So by intermingling the Torah into the, 
essence of the Jew, which is dust, so now it becomes something substance. Now you can't be scattered. Then you assume a permanence. A permanence you cannot be trampled upon. You cannot be done away with. That's the medrash. The Midrash cites a verse in Mishlei. Ela told us Yitzhak. These are the chronicles of Yitzhak. Gil Yogil Avi Tzadik. The father of the Tzadik, Tzadik rejoices. From the word Gilo, rejoices. Violet Chocham. And he gives birth to a wise one, wise man, Yismachbo. And he will rejoice within him. So, which child is Shlomo referring to? That the father rejoiced in his child. Kedneged amoru Shlomo. Lo amoru elo kedneged Yitzchok. What Shlomo meant when he said, Gil yogel avi tzadik, and he will give birth, father the Chocham, to rejoice within him. This is referring to Yitzchok. What happened? Shebishosh shenolad Yitzchok. Hoyu akol smechim. When Yitzchok was born, all existence rejoiced. What's all existence? Shemaim Voretz, the heaven, the earth, Chamo Levono, the sun and the moon, Kochovim Umazolus, the stars and the zodiac. Now the question is why? Why, when Yitzchel was born, why did all existence, from the terrestrial to the celestial to every aspect of existence, because if Yitzchak wouldn't have been created, it's interesting, uses the term created, the world wouldn't have been able to exist. I mean, Yitzchak was also a miracle child. Sorry, man, it wasn't Akoro. So how did she come about? It was a miracle. The world couldn't... If not for my bris, my covenant, which is in existence day and night, heaven and earth would not be in place. A bris el Yitzchok. And Yitzchok is synonymous with the covenant. Shinema ves brisi okemis Yitzchok. My covenant I will establish with Yitzchok. What does this mean? When Yitzchok was born, all existence rejoiced. Because if not for Yitzchok, existence wouldn't exist. Why not? Why not? Now, Yitzchok was the father of Yaakov. If Avram would have perished in the kiln, there wouldn't have been a Yitzchok. He wouldn't have had children. So why was there a Yitzchok? There was a Yitzchok, as we'll see in a moment. There was a Yitzchok because there had to be a Yaakov. Why did Avram not perish in the kiln? In terms of himself, he gave his life to sanctify God's name. So it should have been sufficient. The answer is no, because Avram has a purpose. What's the purpose? That ultimately there should be Yaakov descending from him. But Yaakov was not the, his child. Yaakov was his grandchild. So what is the value? So Avram survives the kiln miraculously as the, the Midrash cited Pasuk. Who redeemed Avram from the kiln? Yaakov. Yaakov redeemed because there had to be Yaakov. Why did it have to be Yaakov? Because what is the objective of creation? There has to be a Torah. So if there has to be a Torah, which nation has relevance to the Torah? Only the Jewish people, only Klal Yisrael. So Bishvil Yisrael Shnikar Reishas. Now who fathered Klal Yisrael? Who fathered the Jewish people? Yaakov. The 12 Shvatim, the 12 tribes. He was the most special of the patriarchs. He was so pure, he was able to father the tribes which are the foundation for the Jewish people. So the way it comes out, if not for Yitzchok, there wouldn't be a Yaakov. So why did all existence joy rejoice when Yitzchok was born? Because now that there's a Yitzchok, there's going to be a Yaakov. But if Yitzchok wouldn't have been born, there wouldn't be a Yaakov. So therefore, as a result of that, heaven and earth rejoiced. And that's im lobrisi yom v'loilo. If not for the Torah that's in effect day and night, the world wouldn't exist. Now, 
Yaakov, Yaakov is Tam Yosheh Olim. Right? He is the perfect man who sat in the tent of Torah. Elo told this Yitzchok, Avram told this Yitzchok. Zesh Omer HaKosuf, again, it cites another verse from Mishlei. Ateres Zekedim B'nei Bonim. The crown of the elders are the grandchildren. The grandchildren are the crown of the, of the grandparents. Feres Bonim, and the glory of the children of Osam. I mean, what does the grandchild pride himself? That is a special grandfather. That's the glory. The glory of the child is my grandfather. But the crown of the grandparents are the grandchildren. That's the crown. What does this mean? Hatzadikim misatrin b'vnei v'neihem. Uvnei misatrin b'avosam. The tzadikim, the devoutly righteous, they are... Misatrin. They are crowned with their grandchildren, Ubeneim, and their children, Mesachim Bavosim. They are crowned with their forefathers. Ketzad, what's the what, what is the uh, example of this? Avram Nisat Mishus Yaakov. Avram was crowned, was cloaked in the merit of Yaakov. Why? Nimrod was the one in, in Kazdim who had thrown Avram into the fiery kiln. What happened? Yorad HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hashem immediately descended to save him from the fire. That he shouldn't be incinerated. Omru Malche Ashores. So the heavenly angel said, Ribonu Shalolom, Lo Zatomatzio. You mean to say, you're saving Avram? Kam Rishom Asid Nulamud Mimenu. How many evil people will descend from him? Yishmoel, Esau, and all the evil throughout the generations, they all descend from Avram. So why are you saving him? You shouldn't continue. Omalahem HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bishul Yaakov ben Beno She'osad Lama Menu. The reason why I'm saving him is because Yaakov, his grandchild, who ultimately is going to descend from him. Ani Matzilo. Okay? So over here, the commentators ask, we find by Yishmael, that he was dying of thirst and the Malochim Rashi cites the bitch the Malochim same to, came to Hashem and says let him die of thirst why? because in the future his descendants will cause the Jews to die because when they're going to be taken into exile to Babylon they're going to say to their captors take us to our cousins Yishmael the Arabs and they'll give us something to eat and drink and they gave them skins filled with stale air they inhaled it, inhaled, inhaled it and they died so the, the angel said to Hashem are you going to perform a miracle for Yishmael where his descendants are going to kill the Jews so Hashem says to the angels Yishmael at this moment is he tzaddik or is he rosha is he righteous or is he evil so they says right now he's righteous so Hashem says God says his predicament is determined by the present not the future therefore Hashem performed a miracle on his behalf so the question is, they ask, what does it mean? He shouldn't be saved because of all the evil that will descend from him. But at this moment, he's tzaddik. He's tzaddik. So if that's the case, he deserves the, the miracle. Right? But the, question's, the question really is not a question. Now, let's say you have evil in the world and there's no way to contend with that evil. And the world definitely will not reach, reach its fruition and its purpose and its objective. So why create existence? What the Malachim was saying, let Avram perish because it has no value if he's saved because the world, of, as a result of all the evil descendants of, the, of Avram, the world's not going to meet its objective. Not as, not as a punishment. We're not punishing Avram when he perishes in the kiln. There's no reason to save him. That's what we're saying. By Yishmol, he should die because he deserves to be punished. He says he doesn't deserve to be punished. He's, he's righteous now. By Avram Avinu, it was a whole different story. 
Why perform the miracle if it has no value? Because ultimately the world's not going to be able to meet its objective because of all the evil who descend from Avram. That's what they were saying. So that Hashem says, because of his grandson Yaakov. Now who was Yaakov? Yaakov was Yaakov Ishtam Yoshev Holim. He was the perfect man who studied Torah. Now all these evil, why do they have the upper hand? Because the Jew doesn't study Torah. We have a kol kol Yaakov, Yadayim, the Esau. So the Midrash says, when, is, when are the hands the hands of Esau? When does Esau have the upper hand and Abe is able to perpetuate and disseminate all types of perversions and evil? That's only if the call of the voice is not the voice of Yaakov. If they're not studying Torah, they're not, they're not engaged in tefillah. But if they are, then they're subordinated. They must submit. So that's what he's saying. He says to the Malachim, all these evil people, because there's going to be Yaakov, he can contend with him. Because as a result of his Torah, he was the personification of Torah that he's going to generate. This will incapacitate the evil, and therefore the Kedusha will have the upper hand. That's what he's answering. I had said to the house of Yaakov who redeemed Avram. What does it mean? When, when did Yaakov redeem Avram? Because if not for Avram, if not for Yaakov being born and being the Ish Torah, the man of Torah, there was no reason for, for Avram to survive the kiln. It only had value to survive the kiln because there was a need to have a Yaakov, to have the Torah, and the Torah itself will counter all the evil that exists in, in existence. So as a result of that, Avram was a beneficiary. Why? As a result of his grandson. He merited to be saved from the kiln because of his grandson. Where do we see the children? They were beneficiaries. They were cloaked because of their grandparents. When Yaakov fled undercover from Lovan, Rodaf Lovan Achrov. Lovan pursued him, wanted to kill him. And Hashem appeared to Lovan while he was pursuing him on the way. Be careful, don't speak to Yaakov, not good and not evil. When they began, when he finally met up with another, and they began sparring with one another, my Yaakov Oman Lovon. What does Yaakov say to Lovon? Lule eloke ovi eloke Avraham. If not for my God, the God of my father, the God of Avraham, Pachid Yitzchak Hoyeli, I'd be gone. You would have destroyed me. So what is he saying? What's the reason why he was saved from the clutches of Lovon? Because eloke ovi Avraham. Ezri. The God of Avram came. So it was the schus of Avram. So what do we find over here? That, uh, that Yaakov is a beneficiary as a result of having the special grandfather. You know, there's a, um, usually you say it at the Seder, famous word from Rabbi Shuleib Diskin, Zech Tzak Levrocho, in Halel, with Rosh Chodesh, Thursday, Friday, we say, Halu es Hashem kol goyim, all the nations will praise God, Shabchu kol umim, and all the, the kingdoms will praise God. Why will they praise? Why will all the nations of the world and all the kingdoms praise God? Ki govar oleinu chazdo, because the chesed, the kindness of God, overwhelmed the Jews, us. So the question is, if David would have said they're praising God because the God's chesed overwhelmed them, they're such a great, to such a degree, the beneficiaries of Hashem's chesed, okay? Why are they praising God? Because they are the beneficiaries of God's chesed at this outstanding, on this outstanding level. But that's not what David said. David says, why are they going to praise God? and extol him, he govar oleinu chazdo. Because God's chesed has overwhelmed us, has overtaken us. Why should they praise God? Because the chesed of Hashem has overtaken the Jew. That's the question he asked. 
So there are many answers to this, but what he said was that we're unaware of many things. Unaware. There are nations in the world plotting continuously to destroy the Jewish people. Continuously. And we're, we're not aware of it. So why don't they destroy us? Because Hashem always, behind the scenes, foils the plot. That they're not able to destroy us. As much as they want to and they plot to destroy us, they're not able to destroy us. Because they should have destroyed us based on the numbers, based on the attempts. So why didn't they? Because Hashem always intervenes, doesn't allow them. So it comes out, the nation will know what they try to do. We're unaware of it. We're in the dark. So therefore, halu Hashem kol goyim shabru kol omim ki gavar alinu Because they recognize as much as we try to destroy the Jew, the chesed of Hashem overwhelms the, us. Therefore, they can't destroy them. Therefore, they're amazed. Therefore, they give praise to God for the way He protects His people. That's the shabru kol omim. He they praise why ki gavar alinu chas. Because the chesed of Hashem has overwhelmed the Jew. Okay. Now. The Medjish says there's a posseg in Yeshaya Kokle Yutzar Olayich Lo Yitzoch all the vessels of the potter which come upon you will not succeed. They're not going to succeed. What is this referring to? Atamot say Yisrael Omer and Fnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu the Jewish people say to God Ribono Lomi, master of the worlds, Rechechu Umos Mishabdin Bonu. See how the nations they enslave us. Ela Melocha Cheres, Eliyoshim Misyots and Olenu. What they do? They're not preoccupied with anything else, but they sit and they convene and they plot against us to destroy us. Here, Shenemar, Shiftom Vikimosim Habita Ani Magnusim. When they're sitting, when they stand. Hashem says, Habit ani, but I gaze upon them and I protect them. Hashem is our, our protection. As much as they plan and plot and do whatever they want to destroy us, Hashem stands and watch us, watches us. What is the, what's the value of all their plottings? As much as they decree, make their decrees, I intervene and I annul them and I destroy them. Okay. The Ficho Ksiv Kokli Yutzer Olayach Lo Yitzloch. Hashem always foils the plot. Now, Adrianus was a Roman emperor. So he said to Rabbi Yeshua, you know, the Pesach refers to the Jewish people as the scapegoat. We're a goat that's encircled by 70 wolves. The nations of the world are wolves. We're Kivsa, Bain, Shivim, Zavim. Zavim. We're among... 70 wolves, each nation wants to devour us. And we're a helpless sheep. A sheep gives us a sheep. And yet they don't succeed to destroy us. So Adriana said to Rabbi Shua, Gedola Kivso, oh, I met his name, Shiv Mizakanium. How great are the oppressors? It shows how benevolent, how kind they are. Could a sheep survive 70 wolves? Not possible. So why did the wolves survive? Why did the sheep survive the 70 wolves being encircled by the 70 wolves, the 70 nations? The answer is evidently because we're benevolent people. This is what our Juliana says to Rabbi Yeshua. Otherwise, how did you survive? Omar lo, so Rabbi Yeshua said to Adrianus, Godol hu aroa shematzilo. Great is the shepherd who protects them, who saves them. Has nothing to do with your car. You people are cruel. You people have no scruples. You people have no inhibition to destroy us. So it's not attributed to your kindness what well, we, we, we survive and we exist. Great is the shepherd who watches the flock and protects it 
and smashes the enemy from before the flock. All the plottings that you have against Klal Yisrael, it's, it's not even consideration it's going to work. We know that by the there's a question whether the Akedah was the last test but according to the Medrash Tanchuma it was the last test. Lech Lecho Mi was the first test and the closing test was Lech Lecho El Maria to go to, to Mount Moriah for the Akedah. We find that as much as Avram wanted to go he had endless interference till he arrived. Kosotan understood that if he succeeds in the Akedah, bringing his son as a sacrifice, whatever prosecution is going to be in the future, that merit will silence him. And that's Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the Yom Adin, Day of Judgment. And when we blow the blast of the shofar, because the shofar is the shofar shalayil, it's the ram's horn, that silences the prosecution of Satan. That's what happens. So Satan understood this. So as much as Sutton prosecutes on Yom Adin, the moment we blow the shofar, shofar, it's, he's silenced. So there's a question, that's the schusta, the Akedah. One of the readings we read on Rosh Hashanah is the Akedah. How Avram brought his only son, his beloved son, as a sacrifice. So the Medjah says, cites a pasuk, God does not associate his name with tzaddikim as long as they're alive. El only after they passed away. Shinemar, as it says in the Posuk, for those who are holy, they're in the land. When are they holy? When are they considered holy? They deserve that classification. When they're already in the ground, when they passed away. The tzaddikim, as great as they are, as long as they're alive, God does not allow His name to be associated with them. Why? Why? Because God doesn't have full belief in them that the Yitzhar will not have some level of influence on them and they'll become evil. So since a person has Bechira and he can become evil till the last moment, God doesn't want to put his name on a person who may choose to become evil. The cave Shem Mesim, but what if once they die, they die righteous, so that now there's no turning back any longer. God allows his name to be specifically on them. But yet we find that Yitzhak, it says, Yitzhak, and Yitzhak was alive. How was he alive? So how do you how do we reconcile it? If God does not associate himself with any living human being, because the person could change the last moment, so why does he refer to Yitzchok? Yitzchok was alive as Elokei Yitzchok Avicha. Why? This is what Hashem says. The God of Avram, your father, and the God of Yitzchok. So there's an argument. Rebrechio for Rabbonon. It's an argument. Rabbonon Amri. Roani, Roa es Afro Kilutsov al Gabi Mizbeach. God, by the Akkad, he sees as if the ashes of Yitzchok are piled on the Mizbeach. That's what atones for us. That's the Akkad. Akkad is not something that happened in the past, but rather it's in the presence he sees. Even though uh, Yitzchak was never put on the Mizbech, on the altar, it was the ram that was put, put in his place. Nevertheless, but since that ram came only as a replacement for Yitzchak, it's as if Yitzchak's ash is on the Mizbech. Okay? One second. Now, when Yitzchak's ash is on the Mizbech, and you see it as him, for all intents and purposes, he passed away. A person who passes from this world doesn't have Yitzchak. 
That's the reason why Hashem, the Midrash says, that's why, he, although he's alive, but it's because Afro shall yitzro tzor v'lufan echo. Rabbi Yachia Mahov in Siyad Seim, Beinov, this is what Rashi said, since he became blind, he wasn't able to see, Kilu mess, he becomes a non-functioning person, Fishoya Gonus, Tochabayas, since he was like concealed in the house, the Yitzhara, Poskim, Meno, and the Yitzhara ceased to have influence over him, Kachsi, Vayiki, Zolkein, Yitzchok, when he became old. Okay? Now it's an interesting argument here. One says, Why is Hashem's name associated with Yitzchok? Because although he's physically alive, it's like he's not alive. Not because he's blind. Because he's already, we see him as a heap of ash. What does that mean? If a person be, is, is incinerated, does he have a Yitzhara? I mean, he's not alive any longer. But so Yitzchok, because his father, and he agreed to be used as the sacrifice for the Akedah, we see him as a heap of ash. That means he did not live any longer with Bechira. Do not live with Bechira. Yeah. The Chachomim, Brachi says, because he was blind, meaning a person is blind, his senses no longer operate, work, he becomes totally incapacitated. He has no interest other than doing the, the will of Hashem. Okay. You know, we find in this week's parsha that there was a famine, and Yitzchok was going to leave the Philistine territory to go to Egypt, like his father went to Egypt. Hashem immediately comes to Yitzchok, says, "Remain in this land, despite the famine. You're going to have a bumper crop." And that year he planted a crop, and it, it yielded a hundred yields of what a normal crop yields in a famine year. It was a miracle. But Hashem says, you remain, dwell in this land, don't leave the land. Why? So the Medjish says, the law is that if you slaughter a, a carbon in the sanctuary, and then you take the meat before you finish the service, like a shlomim or a chatos, a sin offering has to be eaten in the sanctuary. Let's you bring the meat outside of the confines of the sanctuary, outside of its walls, it becomes invalidated. Because that's called the validation of Yotze. It went out of its bounds. So Hashem says to Yitzchok, you can't leave the boundaries of Eretz Yisrael. Why? Because just as when you take the korban out of the confines of the sanctuary, it becomes validated. If you go out of the confines of Eretz Yisrael, of the borders of Israel, you also become invalidated. You become, when it becomes invalidated, right? How do we understand it? Now, of course, he's a living human being. The answer is, if we're saying according to the, according to one interpretation of Midrash, Afro Yitzchok Tzor the Fonov, although Yitzchok is whole as a being, but in terms of his significance, it's as if he was what he was sacrificed. A person is a heap of ash; he has no free choice. So, because since within the context of halacha, his status is he's a heap of ash, and that's the reason why he quells all levels of prosecution against the Jewish people, if that's the case, he has no Yitzhara. He has no evil inclination. For that reason. Okay. The Torah tells us, describes who is Rivka. Rivka is the daughter of Besuel from Padna Ram, that was the community, Padna Ram, the sister of Lovon Harami, the Armenian. So Rashi explains, firstly, this narrative we already know from last week's reading, who she was, who her family was. Her father was Besuel, her brother was Lovon. She had died long, Nichtav, she passed We know she's the daughter of Besuel. All this fact, these facts were presented earlier. 
but rather to say her praise word in this Rivka. What's the, what's her praise word? Shoisa Bas Rosha. She was the daughter of an evil person. Ba'achos Rosha. She was the sister of Rosha. Lovon. Umekoma Achi Resha. And a community with people who are evil, evildoers. Lulamdam Masayim. Now, however, the Orachim Akkadr says something interesting. The Gemara tells us that when Aaron married Elisheva, Elisheva was Aaron's wife, and Aaron was special. His children were not of Avio or Lozi Summer. He had four sons. And the Torah says, who was, who was his wife? Elisheva Basaminodov. Elisheva the door of Minodov, Achos Nachshon. She was the sister of Nachshon, who was the prince of the tribe of Judah. That's who his brother-in-law was. So the question is, whenever we speak about a pedigree of a person, we only trace him always to his father. We don't speak about the brother, Achos Nachshon, this brother of Nachshon. So the Gemara tells us, from here we learn that when you marry a woman, you should check into the quality of the brothers of the wife, of the potential wife. Why? Because the majority of brothers, of children, they emulate the ways of the wife's brothers. They assume those characteristics. So if they're corrupted in, in their character or other qualities, you understand there's going to be a problem. It's going to manifest itself in your children. So that's what Torah wants to tell us. Why did Aaron have such special children? Because who was his brother-in-law? She was the sister of Nachshon. Nachshomen Aminodov, he was the prince of the tribe of Judah. That's the reason. So what happens if you have a brother by the name of Lovon? He was a charlatan. He was a man who had no scruples. He was evil. And you understand, Rivka is his sister. Yitzchak's marrying her. And there's a strong likelihood his children are going to assume that profile of person. It's disastrous. So what is the, the Torah is telling us? Despite the fact that her brother was a lovon, who was a charlatan, who had no scruples when it came to money. Well, other situations, so maybe Yitzhak shouldn't marry at all. Shouldn't marry her. But since, factually, in, in, in reality, she was a tzaddik, she was devoutly righteous, and there was no one else to marry her, marry, that's why he married her. Because there was nobody else to marry. But factually, who was Esau? Esau outpaced lovon a thousand times over. In trickery and dishonesty. That was Esau. Now, who do we attribute Esau to? Achos Lovon Harami. She was the sister of Lovon. So if you say that you're supposed to evaluate the brothers, because you, it may manifest itself in your children, so why did it, Esau, why did it manifest in Esau? Because Rivka was the sister of Lovon. And the majority of brothers follow, assume the characteristics of the uncle. It's interesting. It says she became pregnant. It says, Vatar Rivka Ishto. And Rivka's wife became pregnant. So he explains Ishto. The word Ishto means his wife. Begamachia Kashva Ish. It's numerically Kash means straw, and Ish is fire. What do we say? Beis Yaakov is Ish, Beis Yosef Lahova, and what's Beis Esav? Esav is Kash. Right? What's the reason why only after Yosef was born did Yaakov leave the house of Lavan? Because if you have a flame and you have straw, the straw will not be consumed by the fire because it's not, you need a flame to reach out to consume the straw. That was Yosef. Yosef was the Lahova. Base Yosef is Lahova. The house of Yosef is, 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 is the flame that goes out. But Aish is a, is, a, is a controlled fire. Ishto. 
Rivka, his wife, Ishto is much Ish, Kash ve Ish. Esav is the Kash, is the straw. That's Beis Yaakov, Beis Esav uh, Kash. And what's Beis Yaakov? That's Ish. Okay. Just want to speak about one thing. Now, we know Esav son really Yaakov. Esav hates Yaakov. Why does Esav hate Yaakov? Because he sold the birthright and he felt he was duped. And when Yitzhak was going to give the blessing to Esav, Yaakov was instructed by his mother to come impersonate Esau. She took the hides, the skins, to put it on his chest, on his arms, because Esau was a hairy person. And he took, to, he took the, the birth, he took the brachas of the birthright. He was livid, infuriated, and he vowed to kill Yaakov. So that hate, from that moment onward, festered and throughout the ages. Edom, the Edomites who descent from Esau, they're always avenging what Yaakov had done to their father. This is, this is Esau's son in Yaakov. Esau despises Yaakov. Now, why did Yitzhak give the bracha, or attempt to give the bracha to Esau? Because he didn't know he was evil. He knew he wasn't Yaakov, but because he was the Bukhar, he felt he was deserving the bracha, but if he would have known he was evil, and his whole direction is to destroy Torah, to destroy Kedusha, holiness. Would he have given the brachas? He would have cursed him. That's what he would have done. So why is it Ace of Son of Yaakov? Because Yitzhak was not aware that Ace of was a Russia. So the obvious question is, Rivka, it says when she was pregnant and she felt the rumbling in her innards, in her womb, she went to seek out advice from Shem, who was a prophet. And he told her the two nations in your womb, one represents good, one represents evil. And that's this, this is the rumbling and the agitation in her womb. That Rivka knew when Esau was born that he was the Russia. He knew it. She knew it. Why don't you share it with her husband? Be sure to share it with Yitzchok. And if that she would have shared it with it, we would have never come to a point where Yitzchak would have even considered giving the bracha to Esau. So the whole scenario and context that caused Esau's son of Yaakov would have never come about. So why didn't she share this with Yitzchak? Now, it says when she was suffering from all this agitation and rumbling in her stomach, she went to seek out God, she went to Shem. Now, who was a bigger prophet? Avram or Shem? Avram was a prophet. Why did she have to go to Shem? She should have gone to her father. What about Yitzchok? Yitzchok was a prophet, her husband. If you could go to your husband, do you go to a stranger? So why don't she go and seek out counsel from her husband? What's exactly going on over here? The answer is, she went to Avram. Avram says, I have no idea. I don't understand what this rumbling's about. She went to Yitzchok, he says, I have no idea what it's about. Because a Novi only knows what Hashem communicates to them. Hashem doesn't communicate the fact, you don't know. She went to Shem, Shem told her, two nations, one is good, one is evil, so on and so forth. Now, Rivka herself, if after going to either of them, and they weren't aware, so how does she have a right to share? Then why wasn't Avram aware that one was Esau? Because the Gemara tells us that why did Avram pass away five years before his time? Because if he would have lived longer, he would have seen Esau going out, becoming a very serious violator of the Torah. And that would have caused him tremendous angst and pain. And Hashem says to Avram, when you passed away, you'll pass away b'seva tova. In a good old age, knowing that this is the grandson he's leaving over, it wouldn't have been so good. Right? Now what about Yitzchok? So that's why she couldn't go to Avram. That's why Hashem withheld this fact from Avram. 
because it would have been contrary, contradictory to the Seva Tova. What about to her husband? If, if, Avram, if Yitzhak would have known that he was a Russia, what would have he done? Not he wouldn't have attempted him, bro. He would have cursed him. And since the context of existence has to be the strife between Esav and Yaakov, this is Esav son of Yaakov, therefore Yitzhak couldn't be informed. Because if Yitzhak would have known the truth, it, the whole future would be a different future. This is the understanding. So it's not she didn't share it with him because there's some kind of breakdown in communication between the two of them. She didn't share it with them because she understood if Hashem did not reveal it to them, she has no right to share it with them. The Torah tells us, the Chazal tells us, that when the Posik says that Esav came weary from the field. He came Oyef bin Asode. He was a hunter. So it says he was weary and worn, fatigued, because he violated five cardinal sins. Five cardinal sins. Committed murder, committed adultery, blasphemed God, did idolatry. This was the real McCoy, Esav. Now, when he heard, he saw Yaakov cooking lentil soup, which a novel, a mourner eats. He says, what happened? He saw he had soot on his face when he was, he says, our grandfather passed away. So when he heard that Yitzchok, that Avram died, what was Esav's response? Les did les dayan. There's no judgment, there's no judge. Totally a statement of, heretical statement. There's no God. Boy, he lived 175 years. Because Esav knew Avram really should have lived 180 years, which he was meant to live. Why did he have five years taken off his life that he should not witness Esav transgressing five cardinal sins? So why did Esav say, Les din les dayan? There was no judge in judgment. Because he says, my father, my grandfather was shortchanged five years of his life. But why was he shortchanged? So what was the cause of his becoming a heretic? His own evil that he created, the murder, the adultery. That's why Avram had it five years. He was the cause of it. As he was the cause of Avram losing five years of his life, he was the basis for the cause of what? Of becoming a blasphemer. Because one's linked to the other. He only blasphemed God because he saw it. God shortchanged his, his grandfather. God didn't shortchange his grandfather. It would have been contradictory to the promise that you will die in a good old age not being unaware of where your grandfather, where your grandson goes.